brought to you by Accenture Extended Reality. This is Field of View. Hello and welcome to Field of View. My name is Nick Rosa from Accenture. And my name is Daniel Colliani from AIXR, the Academy of International Extended Reality. And uh, uh, today we're going to explore another very interesting topic related to the world of extended reality. We're going to talk about neuroscience and we're going to talk about uh, VR as an empathy machine, but we're also going to talk about uh, how virtual reality can open up a new field of research in the way that we connect and we interact with each other as human beings. And as many of you know, Field of View is really about finding as much about the person and their origin story and about the industry that they work within. So the goal of Field of View is all about doing a real deep dive into immersive technology and uh, finding out all the different aspects of how it has an impact on your life. And of course, you can find Field of View on any of the podcasts that uh, uh, wherever you get your podcasts uh, every single month. And we are available on all the different platforms, uh, Apple and Spotify, but also YouTube and video if you want to see us. Yeah, you and, can see uh, our, our beautiful faces. And we're actually doing this <laughs> in the nighttime, right, Nick? Uh, because our yeah, guest today this... is based in New, New Zealand. Yeah, uh, our guest today is based in New Zealand and uh, is a professor of human computer interaction. And it is with our greatest pleasure that we can introduce you, Professor Mark Billinghurst. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? Thanks for being I'm with good. us. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Uh, so, Mark, uh, as you know, uh, in uh, uh, our podcast, uh, we we usually like to start with a little bit of a, an origin story uh, for all the guests that we have uh, as uh, in in, a, in our podcast. And it would be great if you could uh, start introducing yourself and what you do right now. And uh, tell us a little bit more about so what brought you towards the world of extended reality and virtual reality and research and uh, to do what you're actually doing. Sure thing. So I'm a professor at the University of Auckland here in New Auckland, New Zealand, but I'm also working as a professor at the University of South Australia in Adelaide, Australia. I split my time between New Zealand and Australia. And I've got a long history in AR and VR going back to right to the uh, late 1980s, 89, when I, when I first experienced technology. And I got involved in the field because at that time I was just finishing um, a master's degree in uh, mathematics. And as part of my project, we were doing some work on uh, visualization of uh, solar uh, flares. And we were using very uh, expensive, large computers to create uh, essentially graphs of these solar flares. But at the same time, and I was getting frustrated because it was really hard to understand the 3D structure from these 2D pictures. And at the same time, uh, I became aware that virtual reality was, was just starting in the US, uh, coming in, out of the um, military and into uh, public universities. And so I got interested in how that technology could be used to uh, showcase uh, 3D graphics and, and create a much more realistic um, rendering of what the mathematics I was doing. So when I was just... Um, finishing my um, master's degree, I took a break and I went and spent an, an internship at the University of Washington and at the, the brand new virtual reality lab, the human interface technology lab at the University of Washington with uh, with Tom Furness. And that kind of started me this whole direction. Getting, I got really excited about how, how you could immerse yourself in, in 3D environments. And then that kind of led to my career uh, for the next 20 years, I guess. Wow. Tom has been one of the guests of our podcast, so you can check the episode in our playlist as well. Uh, wow, that's that, that's super interesting. I was going to yeah. ask, like, uh, like what, what was it like uh, kind of working with Tom and, and kind of like, you know, being in that early pioneering place of, of extended reality? Well, it was a really amazing experience. I went there because um, <clears throat> at the time there were really only four or five universities in the world that had virtual reality equipment. You know, it was... It was very expensive. You needed at least half a million to a million dollars to be able to have the computer and the head mount display. And he was really a pioneer in the field, having just left the previous year from the US Air Force to uh, create his laboratory at the University of Washington. So it was really inspiring to be able to go there and, and to you know, kind of learn from somebody who'd been in the field for 20 years before me and had been really at the, the, the um, founding of, of virtual reality. And they, we had some really amazing people in the lab that were we really felt we were on the verge of creating something groundbreaking and, and being able to create new technology that could help 
impact um, humanity for good. It was a really amazing experience those um, few months I spent there as an internship. And then because of that, he invited me to come back to as a um, as a PhD student. And I didn't um, hesitate at jumping at the chance to come. And then I spent another seven or eight years there completing my PhD and other studies. Uh, your background, though, is, is in wearable computers. Can you tell us a little bit more about that part of your life and how you ended up from studying VR to go to wearable computers and back, basically? Well, when I was doing virtual reality, uh, of course, the, the field of research was wide open, and I got really interested in how uh, you could use it to support collaboration. And then that led me into working in uh, augmented uh, reality and being able to overlay computer graphics onto the uh, real world, especially for supporting face-to-face uh, -face and remote um, collaboration. I mean, as part of that, you know, once you start building augmented reality systems and, and you have a headset on your head that lets you see the real world as well as computer graphics, then you pretty much want to cut the tether between the computer and be able to walk around and uh, see that those graphics wherever you want. And that led me into wearable uh, computing because you, you need to have a wearable system that allows you to um, go wherever you want in the world and see information superimposed in the world. And actually, as part of that, I went and spent a, a summer working for uh, British Telecom in their laboratory in Ipswich in the UK. And they had a very strong wearable computing group there. And so I, I was able to do some wearable computing projects uh, with them and, and then kept on doing research in that field for the next few years afterwards as well. And, and which year are we talking about here? Uh, I would have gone... Computers research. Yeah, I would have gone to British Telecom in, I think it was 1990... Uh, wow. seven in 1998 so it was fairly early on in those days I mean in those days wearable computers were quite large uh, backpack uh, machines and um, I was gonna say you could yeah. hardly call it I guess like wearable back then I mean it was wearable but it's you know not what we would class as you know wearable technology today yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, that's crazy and, and and I remember, I mean, at that time, I was using a massive Motorola mobile phone, like a, a, a big brick uh, yeah. from, from Vodafone. So it's, uh, it's it sounds like a, a, another lifetime, another life ago. I'd um, love for you to I, send me that photo, Nick, so we can just put it on screen for everyone right now. <laughs> oh, man, I was uh, a little, uh, I was around, probably I was... Yeah, in my twenties, I think. Wow, that's the time flies. <laughs> anyway, um, so I mean, this is this is super fascinating, and uh, I wanted to ask you a question about wearable computers and wearable technology in general, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, we've been hearing a lot about the advent of wearable technology and wearable uh, for smart jewels or smart clothing and all those wearable smart technology that would change our life but at the end of the day the only device that have been able to uh, have a market penetration a substantial market penetration has been the apple watch uh, both in terms of mobile payment and wearable payment but also in terms of like collecting data and biometrics about the user why do you think this happen why why for example, smart rings or smart fabrics are not here yet or will never be here from your point of view? Well, I, I think it's just a matter of time. So it's interesting you brought up the example of using the Motorola a brick phone you know, that was around in the um, late uh, 80s to early uh, mid 90s. And it, it took a, you know probably 10 years or so to go from that to the um the the small razor flip phone and, and the more popular phones that we have today and if you and if and it's it's a good um 10 or 12 years to go from those early phones to the iphone and the android devices that really established uh the phone as a center of the mobile ecosystem and so I think that the wearable devices you're seeing now, certainly the Apple Watch, but but other devices like Google Glass and and smart glasses, they're probably at the kind of Motorola brick phone uh, stage of use. And within the next decade or so, we'll start seeing them become much more widely used. And just the same, you know, with the Motorola, those, those first phones, they were you know, cost several thousands of dollars. They had 20 to 30 minute talk time, and they were mostly bought by um, 
uh, real estate agents or business executives that need to be contacted while on the move. And people started using them at work and then got used to them and, and got uh, uh, they created some demand for them. I think the same thing is happening with, with other wearable devices. For example, people in, in, in the medical field or in, in industry, some of them now are using uh, smart glasses or head-mounted displays for uh, remote collaboration or for yep. um, maintenance support. And once people start using those in the workplace, then you know, five or ten years later, they start creating demand for them in their everyday life. When the when the cost drops from you know two thousand dollars down to two hundred dollars, then you'll start seeing people using those more. You can see a number of companies pushing in this space. Uh, for example, Snap with their Snap uh, spectacles. Um, you know, they had a pretty well. I guess it was a modest success with the earlier version of spectacles that um, didn't have a, a display in them, and now they're just uh, they've done a pre-release launch of the Spectacles 4, which has cameras and display. That'll be probably about $400 when it comes to market. So that's about the price point you can expect larger consumer uptake. So I think we're you know, probably five to 10 years away before more widespread consumer use of other types of wearables other than, than, than watches. This, this is super interesting, especially because, I mean, we have also Facebook that just launched the, the glasses with Ray-Ban with the Facebook right. stories. And uh, um, I mean, everybody was was expecting. Everybody in the XR world was expecting a pair of glasses that could have like some sort of visualization, uh, like the Unreal, for example. But at the end of the day, they they opted for something more simple and more uh, used to the everyday life look that uh, that normal glasses have. Uh, another question for you about the industry, and then we I think that we're gonna move more towards your. Um, field of specialization, so uh, interaction, human interaction with virtual reality and especially brain machine interfaces and uh, recording of neural activity. Um, this date of um, the, the advent for wearable devices keeps moving. It's a sort of a moving target. Um, when the, uh, the first Oculus Rift has been launched, Everybody announced this new wave of technology of virtual reality driven by this amazing Kickstarter uh, run by Palmer Lucky. Uh, this didn't happen yet in the form that everybody was expecting. Uh, we are living in a more slow evolving business and, and, and uh, the technology is moving at a slower pace than what was expected by a lot of futurists and uh, venture capitalists. Um, the, the, the inflation point that everybody was thinking about was around 2021, then moved to 2020, then moved to 2021, 2022, 2023. And now we are talking about 2025, eventually 2028. So what do you think is the crucial factor that is holding back the market penetration for this kind of devices? Is the lack of a proper ecosystem or is the lack of a proper business model for monetizing um, the, all these technologies and content delivery? Or is the proper technology that is not there yet for the miniaturization and uh, you know, social acceptance of these devices? Well, I think you have a couple of things. So first of all, in virtual reality, I think the, the growth is happening fairly s smoothly. I, I'm not sure what the figures are, but I wouldn't be surprised this year if there are around uh, 10 million um, consumer yeah. VR displays being sold. And and companies like um, you know uh, Facebook do a great job with the Oculus Quest. Yeah. And, and once you have um, once you start seeing software companies making a million dollars off individual apps, uh, then that's going to start driving the ecosystem. Because that means now that software developers know there's a large enough install base that they can build an application that's going to be, be profitable for them. And of course, you started seeing the first unicorn companies like Rec Room start to appear. But yeah. I, I think one of the challenges, though, is that with virtual reality, you have um, only a certain range of use cases. You know, you can imagine using it for gaming, of course, for training, uh, for education. But um, the bigger opportunity potentially is around augmented reality, where you can have a much wider range of use cases. You know, you can imagine Correct. people wearing yeah. smart glasses in, in everyday life in dozens or hundreds of different applications. But the, the challenge has been um, currently to get the form factor down to a, to a form factor where people can wear the glasses uh, throughout their 
day and being able to use them without um, uh, having to worry about uh, what people think of them or the social consequences. And, and we've seen some examples of companies that have been able to do that. Uh, um, the North uh, Focals were a nice example of a, of a, s a smart glass that was in a really regular glass form factor. Yeah, nice. Um, and um, of course, they got sold. So, so um, you know, and then the Snap Spectacles were another one. So I think what you'll find is that the you'll get growth in the VR ecosystem um, tracking along nicely, you know, 10 million this year, 20 to 30 million next year. But then in the next two to five years, um, whenever Apple or Facebook starts launching their smart glasses, then you'll see a much larger uptake in the wearable AR displays. And, and in fact, in 10 years time, you might find that there's tw twice as many AR glasses in the market as there are uh, VR uh, glasses because of the wider use cases. So I think that's where you're going to get a lot of the growth. And you know, maybe in 15 or 20 years' time, we'll also start seeing um, you know, half a billion or, or, or so um, smart glasses and VR devices being sold every year. That's really interesting because I think Nick, you know, like when you're in the moment, right? When we when we live in VR and AR <laughs> and, and this this world that we live in every single day, sometimes we get this perceived conception that things are moving quite slowly and you know things aren't moving fast enough, especially when all of us are really, really excited about the technology yeah. and really want it to grow. But I think, you know, you take that step back, right? And you take a look at literally like how long it took for certain other technologies to really become mainstream and, and become, you know, ubiquitous in everyday life. I think it's it's crazy to to see the the, the sheer growth and and trajectory that things are happening. Uh, I I agree. Um, my only concern is that um, it's uh, in in the field of augmented and virtual reality we are talking about numbers in the millions, while in the mobile market we're talking about numbers in the billions. So obviously, uh, the kind of uh, uh, market penetration of very transformative technologies uh, is, is the, the perception of this kind of uh, uh, presence and market penetration is completely relative to those kind of numbers and to those kind of industries. If you think about, you know, how many lives and how many uh, parts of our businesses that we use in our everyday life, internet change uh, or mobile transformation and the advent of mobile devices change. And, uh, and uh, you know, we are still awaiting for the famous uh, augmented reality iPhone moment that uh, mm -hmm. sooner or later will come thanks to Apple or Facebook or another company or Niantic uh, that's, uh, that will launch uh, well, this th transformative product. I think if you product. look at the, um, the tracking of the uptake, I've seen a graph that was... Um shown at the AWE conference, I think a year or two ago, that showed, uh, if you look at the years since the launch of the first uh, smartphones, and it, it took, I think it took about 20 years for them to get to their first billion um, users. And if you track that graph against the, the uptake in AR and VR displays, we're tracking along fairly uh, well. If, if you count that those 20 years from um, the um, launch of or the kind of the re relaunch of VR with with um, uh, Palmer, Luki, and, and the Oculus um, Quest. Of course, VR itself has been around since the '60s, but it always really wasn't yeah. until um, the you know with with the uh, Oculus um, uh, relaunch that it became again a consumer device that everybody could use. So if you if you track from that perspective, we've we've been going now. Um, I guess it's been about seven or eight years since since that was um, since the Oculus relaunched, and um, I think we're doing pretty well in terms of uptake. Um, you know, we've, we're relative to seven or eight years into the um, mobile phones since the Motorola uh, brick phone. Mark, I, I have a. Um, I think it's uh, it, it's important for us to start deep diving into the uh, hot topic of this uh, podcast, which is. Uh, the aspect linked to neuroscience and neural interactions using this kind of technologies between users and uh, the kind of research that you've been doing uh, in your lab. Can you tell us a little bit more what are you researching and uh, some of the breakthrough moments that you had during your career in this field? Sure. So for most of my research career, I've been focusing on how the technology can be used to enhance face-to-face uh, -face and remote 
collaboration. One of the things that occurred to me um, early on when I was uh, looking for a PhD topic was that um, traditional conferencing technology like video conferencing, there's this artificial seam between the digital space and the real world. You know, we can see each other on the, uh, the computer screen, but if I have a second monitor up or if I have some other, infam other windows open, then if I turn my attention to that, then I can no longer see you on, on the, the monitor and that breaks the, um, it creates an artificial seam between those digital spaces. So when, when I realized that in the late uh, 90s, it occurred to me with augmented reality, because we can put the content back into the real world, we can reproduce more what happens in face-to-face -face communication, where we're all sitting around a table, there's some interesting stuff on the table we want to talk about, and we can see each other's face expressions and the digital content at the same time. So that got me involved in a long journey on using AR for um, collaboration. And, and similarly, you know, we can use AR to bring in remote people into our real environment. You have these life-size virtual characters appearing around uh, the table. But then in the last uh, four or five years, I got more involved in uh, looking at how we could not only communicate what we're seeing and hearing other people, but also what we're feeling. And so I came up with this idea of empathic um, computing and empathic computing really exists at the convergence of three uh, spaces one is this trend towards uh, experience capture so we have more technology now that allows us to capture our surroundings and share them with other people you know 360 cameras and depth sensors and other things like that the second uh, trend is towards much much higher bandwidth we can use more natural communication so you know we can have a gigabit fiber connection to my apartment now here in Auckland compared to the dial-up modems that I was using at the early VR days and then the third connection is towards uh, computers that have implicit understanding so we can have co computers now that can look at us with cameras or listen to us with microphones and understand what we're doing and to some extent understand what we're feeling and so those three things together combine to mean now we have a platform to create technology that can uh, share what we're seeing, hearing, and feeling with other people. So a really important part of that, and so we've been using AR and VR technology to enable that, but a really important part of that is being able to measure people's emotional and cognitive um, states. And so we use physiological um, sensors, you know, heart rate sensor or uh, brain activity to be able to measure that and then convey that to other people. So I think for um, and, and actually now what you're starting to see is VR and AR devices with some of those sensors in them. You've got displays which have eye trackers in them uh, or heart rate sensors. And so I think the next generation of VR devices will have a lot more ability to capture some of that physiological data. And then there becomes a question about how we can now share that and use that to uh, create much more empathic experiences with other people. And so that's what we're working at right now. It's a very exciting area uh, to be in. And some of the research that uh, uh, we discussed prior to this recording is fascinating, like visualizing automatically the kind of emotions that are detected by those sensors around the user and, and seeing how the other people react. Okay, can you tell us a little bit more about this kind of experiments that you're running? Oh, sure. So in fact, one of the most exciting experiments is looking at how we can uh, use um, or measure brain activity of people doing a shared task and look at brain synchronization. So um, when about 15 years ago, people discovered that when people do a task in the real world uh, and they can measure the brain activity using EEG or, um, or fRMI or, or other um, or FNIRS or other um, technology, then if they measure the brain activity of both people doing that task, you know, maybe playing a game together or talking with each other, sometimes the uh, electrical, the phase of those electrical signals becomes in sync. And when that happens, people report that they are feeling much more connected and coordinated, and they feel that they get into a kind of a flow state with the person working with them. So that's been studied for the last 15 years or so in the real world. And then about a year and a half ago, we started studying that in virtual reality. And actually, we, we were the first people to study that in virtual reality. And one of the reasons why we did that is because we thought that virtual reality might be able to get people into that flow state much more easily. And also we can do some things in virtual reality you can't do in the real world, such as you can put somebody into another person's uh, body. And so both people can share the same virtual body, have the same perception of the uh, virtual space. And that shared perception might create um, that uh, brain synchronized state even much more readily. And so we've been doing a lot of research over the last 
uh, two years or two, um, now looking at how we can use AR and VR to create that uh, brain um, synchronization. Wow. That, that's <laughs> fascinating. And so, that, so you can I, really create like a like a clear, like you, you like that that aspect of putting someone else in someone else's body really can create a connection or that clear empathy that you can't really you know have otherwise, I guess. Well, yes, you get a couple of things. So first of all, um, there are a number of technologies now that allow you to share what you're seeing with somebody else so they see the world from your perspective. So we've done that for a long time since the, uh, the, the um, late 90s. I, I was working and putting cameras on people's heads and sharing live video view uh, with other people. But more recently, one of the challenges of that, though, is you can really only see where the other person's looking. So more recently, we've done things like put 360 degree cameras on your head. So you can now look around wherever you like and and share what you're looking at. And, and then most recently, we looked at how we can do real time depth capture and so create 3D models of your environments. So that allows you to share the space and, and now you feel like you're in the same space as somebody else. But uh, with uh, the physiological sensing, their emotional state so we've done some research also in capturing people's heart rate and then sharing that heart rate with somebody else with, with the with the, the theory that if you can hear somebody else's heart rate then and, and you know they're playing a game or doing some activity which makes them excited that may make you feel more excited uh, as as well and of course there's lots of challenging research around that one of the big research questions is you know how do you share somebody else's um, heart rate. So you know, do you have an icon on the screen that flashes and said, this is my heart rate, or do you have some sound or other cues? And so we've done some research on the best way to uh, share physiological cues to create that um, connection. And then also how do you recognize emotional uh, state and being able to share that? And then um, how can you create better sensors that can be used to do that? You know, people now, you know, do you want to wear this big brain cap that has to measure your brain activity, or there's, is, is there a better way that you can create um, those senses? So there's lots of activity and lots of exciting research we've done in this area. Super interesting. Um, uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask you is uh, uh, I'm doing um, a lot of research recently on the field of philosophy, uh, the intersection between philosophy, sociology, and technology especially because uh, a lot of people right now are talking about the metaverse and how this is going to change the world. And uh, uh, it's interesting to read a lot of comments from many sides of, you know, of the coin and, 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 and trying to, to figure out if the people that are saying that this is going to destroy our society uh, are right or the people that are saying this is going to improve our society are right. Or, uh, I mean, it, it seems to me, though, that... Uh, it's more going to be like a sort of a an evolution of the society and the way that we perceive the world and we consider our reality. Because obviously, if you mix the real with the digital, uh, and and this is part of your everyday life, exactly like it happens right now with mobile phones, this becomes the normal and this has become the real. So there, there's not going to be distinction between the digital and and the real in the future because they're going to be so interconnected that you're not going to be able to make a distinction about who you are or what you do on social network or in the metaverse to what you do in reality, because it's, it's all the same continuum. And, and, and my question for you is, how do you think that the perception of other people's feeling will change with this kind of technology? accessing all those biometric data at, you know, just a, at a glance with augmented reality glasses or virtual reality glasses, if you are in a full VR environment, do you think that we're going to be able to communicate better and to understand each other better? Or do you think that it's going to be even more divisive and more polarizing like the, the world that we're living right now? Well, that's a really interesting question. I think that there's, with, with any technology, there's, um, pros and cons for the technology and also a lot of unintended use cases start arising so for example you know when the f first um, computers were being networked in the um, uh, 60s and 70s and 80s you know who would have thought that would come to create something like uh, Facebook or, or large-scale social networks and you know and how these might have some impact onto 
you know, everyday lives and even the politics of everyday lives and, and the positive and negative impacts that it might have. So it's it's very hard to say whether a technology is, is inherently good or evil. I think generally it's it's um most technologies are fairly neutral, but how people use them can be for good or evil. And then you get a lot of unintended consequences. In terms of the um the work we're doing with uh, and being able to perceive other people's emotional uh, states, there's lots of pros and cons around that. And of course, there are huge amounts of privacy concerns as as well. You know, if you're in a, a meeting and you know you, you may not want the person you're talking to, to to know whether or not you're feeling stressed or emotional while you're in at that meeting. So I think there needs to be a lot of research done in in that space. Um, there's also uh, in many ways, what we're doing is just a, a, another point on the continuum in terms of trying to uh, reproduce and then enhance what people would have access to in face-to-face -face collaboration. If you think back uh, with uh, how technology has evolved around communication, you know, the big leap forward with the telephone allowed us to send our voices anywhere on the earth. And then video conferencing, well, that started in the 50s, really only gained traction about 20 um, years ago, now start us, us sharing our faces anywhere we wanted. But with large social VR, you start having the ability to share spatial uh, cues. And then what we're looking at now is, you know, being able to share emotional states. It's kind of the next iteration of that. And I think it's it's going to create positive and negative con uh, con connotations. And there will need to be, um, just as with any, any technology, controls and checks and balances put into place for that. But there's also going to be lots of un unintended consequences. You know, you could imagine that the technology we're working on could have a really positive effect in uh, counselling or in um, uh, mental health where the uh, counsellor can now be aware of people's um, emotional state or in, in training where you want to measure cognitive load or other things like that. But it also has a lot of negative effects as well. So I'm hoping that we have a good dialogue around uh, what should be the um, uses of the technology and how we can uh, put checks and balances in place around it. I'm, I'm interested then to know, obviously, you know, you, you talked a little bit about how augmented reality has, has a lot more potential use cases in everyday life to, to you. So I'm wondering how some of the things that you, we're talking about just now might apply differently to virtual reality and, and to augmented reality. Oh, that's a good question. So, of course, in virtual reality, the goal is to immerse you in this virtual space and then the computer fully generates everything that you're seeing and uh, perceiving. And so given that, it becomes much easier for the system to monitor what your emotional state is and also to generate content that may create social emotional states. You know, if you're playing a virtual reality game that's supposed to be scary, then it's relatively easy for the computer to create the content that might be scary and then monitor your heart rate or other emotional cues to see if you're getting scared or not and change the content based upon uh, how you're, you're feeling. In augmented reality, that's a lot more difficult because, of course, in this case, the system generates part of what you're perceiving, but um, you're also in the real world. And so now the, the uh, system also has to generate a model of the real world um, which is can be very complicated and can be unknown. So now you've got a computer which is kind of create a model of uh, uh, imperfect model of your real environment and surroundings, and then using that to try and understand the emotions that you're feeling as as well. So in many ways, um, the uh, AR um, use case is a lot more complicated because the system has a lot more imperfect knowledge of what you're seeing and doing in the real world compared to you being inside an immersive um, virtual environment. And of course, also with VR, you can do a lot of things which aren't possible in the real world. So you can imagine social VR experiences where everybody's able to fly or, you know, they have some sort of fantasy land or you can have a variety of body forms that don't match anything that is in the real world. And so there's a lot more opportunity for fantasy and, and for a, dis a suspension of, of disbelief, I would say. So, so, I mean, if you're using like the, this technology with VR and you're doing, let's say, training, for example, then uh, if you want to put someone in a stressful situation, you could potentially take a look at their, you know, stress levels and see, you know, what, how, how they react into this. I and mean, if they're totally fine, you could just keep cranking up the pressure and pressure until they get to that state of stress that you're looking for, for that particular training module, module I guess. Yes, in fact, we've done work similar to that. So um, 
until now, most people are using virtual reality for training for a long time, but most VR training experiences are kind of simple experiences where you put, um, you know, a training scenario, the person does some task, you monitor what they're doing, and if they do the task correctly, then you might present another scenario or give them a corrective feedback. But in... Um, we had the theory that actually when people are learning, if the, if the task is too difficult, you know, if it's um, then you kind of give up and, and you, you can't do it. And if it's too easy, then you don't really learn much from it. So you really want to tune the task to be at the level where it's cognitively challenging, but not too challenging. And so about three years ago, we did a project that would um, adaptively uh, change the VR task based on the cognitive capacity of somebody. So you had, before people did the task, you measured their uh, cognitive load, you know, you gave them a, a task that was mentally really challenging and you could measure how well they performed in that task. And then you could put them into a virtual environment and we did it so you could iteratively crank up the complexity until you reached that same peak level of performance which you got um, in the non-VR environment. And, and by doing that, uh, we explored how you could uh, train people much faster. So instead of wasting time with them going through um, you know, hours of training at a level where the simulation was very simple and they weren't learning anything, you could really quickly get into that peak performance level and stay in that level so they could train much quicker. So we've done some work like that. Um, and then as you said, uh, you know, not just monitoring their mental cognitive load, but also stress level or other emotional states, you could also um, provide a much more effective training system. As, as well. So if, if you, you know, you want to train a firefighter to respond um, well under stress, monitor their stress level and increase the complexity of the task until they had a lot of stress and then train them and provide uh, feedback so they learn how to respond well under that, well under that stressful situation in ways that you couldn't do in the real world because it's too dangerous or time consuming or difficult. What's the... Uh status right now of the kind of tools that you have in your uh, arsenal in order to measure um, the um, wave um, the wave the, the wavelengths of the brain response of the user right now are we already at a stage that we can be pretty accurate or do you think that this needs some more of some more evolution in the technology in the way that it would capture those uh, brain waves Oh, well, no, there's a lot of work needs to be done. So there's, there's, there's a, a range of different physiological sensors that you can use to measure people's cognitive load and emotional state. Things from heart rate sensors to eye gaze to the GSR, the sweat level, to brain activity. But they're all different levels. So, for example, uh, last month, I guess, you know, it was probably May this year, Hewlett Packard released their Omnicept uh, VR display. And in the Omnicept, it has... Uh, eye tracker, it has pupillometry, it has also a face camera that can measure your, your lower face expression, and it has a heart rate sensor in, in the, the face plate. And so those are all technologies that are working quite well now at a consumer level. You know, if you look back, I can put a heart rate sensor in your head mount, then you can imagine that companies in the coming years will do the same thing. So that's using similar sensors to what's in your smartwatch or other things like that. So those sensors are all... Um, in terms of the, the data capture, it's pretty robust. There's still a lot of work needs to be done around it, how you map that, that data to emotional or state or cognitive load. And Hewlett Packard provides you know, some software to help with that. But then at the other end, the, you know, the brain activity um, in the laboratory, people have been monitoring and using EEG equipment for a long time, and it's pretty robust. But getting that out to real world situations is a whole different um, ball game where you know people are now walking around and you know that movement causes noise or you've got to try and put it into a form factor that's that's wearable as opposed to um, a system that's on a cap but which has gel and can only be used for 20 minutes at a time so I, I would say that you know with certain sensors like heart rate sensors they're certainly robust enough to be used uh, widely in, in a consumer AR and VR uh, displays, you know, eye tracking is another example, but for brain activity monitoring, we're probably 10 to 15 or 20 years away from something which can be used uh, reliably in a um, consumer form factor. But that's why we're working in the space is because we want to uh, kind of uh, uh, explore the future of technology going forward. And you can see, you see other companies working in the space as well, you know, um, Valve is working with, in collaboration with OpenBCI, with their Galea um, head mount display that should come on the market next year. And this display includes EEG sensors 
with the wide range of physiological sensors um, as well. But but it's a very big. Uh, just, uh, and it should be mentioned we have a great yeah. field of view episode with Joseph from their team. Um, oh, perfect. On, right. on on that headset. So if you want to learn more yeah. about that uh, on on how they've used that in on your to measure brain waves, then take a look at that episode as well. Yeah, so that's a good example of how the technology is now starting to come into the consumer space. But that's going to be, that hits, it's going to be thousands and thousands of dollars. And so it's, it's really a, a first version, and it might be five years before it's something that people, or 10 years before something people can have in their everyday living room. So uh, this is like the million dollar question. Uh, is what Elon Musk preaching about Neuralink something that is just... Uh, smoke and mirrors or like a sort of a marketing uh, uh, technique or it, do you think that there's anything real in the stuff that he's doing right now? Well, I think there's lots of potential for Neuralink, but I think it's going to be a long way before it gets into our homes. But certainly in the medical um, and rehabilitation space, there's been a lot of potential. And people have been working on uh, embeddable um, uh, electrodes into the brain uh, for a while, things like artificial retinas and other things like that. But but until now, mostly they've been confined to the uh, rehabilitation or to the um, medical treatment um, space. And I suspect with Neuralink, it'll be the same for at least a decade or, or more. Um, but there's a lot of potential there. So I wouldn't be surprised in, in 20 years or, or, or 30 years, you know, more people may be getting embedded electronics into their into their head. Um, and, and we'll see. You know, Elon's a fantastically wealthy person and he's got lots of um, incredibly talented people working for him so if anybody can make it work on a large scale i'm sure it's going to be him and his team and uh, um i mean i wanted to go back quickly to uh, the topic that you covered before about the uh, uh, ethical aspects of this kind of technology and and uh, using xr to improve empathy and to read each other emotions and uh, to improve communication um you know that in Europe, especially where um, we are located, we are not technically in Europe. Both me and Daniel. Daniel actually is in Europe because I'm Daniel in Europe. is in uh, is in yeah. Italy, but I am in the UK. So yeah. uh, we're on the continent of Europe, right? We're we in the continent that. of Europe, right? So I mean, we have all those uh, GDPR uh, laws right here uh, that, by the way, are still in in place even in, in the UK. Uh, that's um, are very uh, restrictive when it comes to uh, data privacy and uh, what can be read for the user. Um, what do you think are the should be from your point of view? I mean, you've been studying this for for years. What do you think should be the limits of what this technology could do in terms of communicating? What should do? Broad, well, yeah. Mm -hmm should do in 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 in, uh, in 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 terms of communicating a broadcasting emotions and data to other people well it's I, a very open what... answer <laughs> but i mean i would like to have your point of view on this well certainly I, I think in many ways the gdpr laws in europe are a good thing so people should definitely have control over their own um, data and also the rights to be able to share that um, um, data and uh, they should also be made aware of uh, what some of the rights are that they're signing up for or giving away. You know, sometimes people will install a mobile app on their phone and they'll check the accept box and don't really realize what they've been doing. And, and before they know it, you know, they've given their poker app on their phone the ability to record their location and camera and microphone feeds. And you, you might say, well, why does a poker game need that ability so um similarly with with these um technologies there's a, a lot more ability to um uh, there's a lot more privacy issues around them you know if i'm if i've got a technology that measures my heart rate over time and that becomes available to my insurance company are they going to somehow change their um, insurance premiums based on my heart rate or lack of activity or other things. So I think a lot should be conveyed back to or um, relying on the individual user in terms of their rights. Um, and also it should be made very, very clear what some of the um, potential privacy implications are of uh, sharing that technology. I noticed that um, Facebook, um, you know, they, they make regular calls for uh, research proposals from researchers and the mo one of the most recent rounds was a, a set of research proposals around privacy and about how you a number of topics including how you can clearly communicate to end users 
what the privacy implications are of the technology that they're using. So I think that's super important. Um, it's it's challenging though because you know the laws that we are are on the books are sometimes twenty years behind what um, the technology um, is, and sometimes we don't realize what some of the implications of the technology are until after we've um, launched it. So there needs to be ways also to go back to go and change those laws as as needed. I think it's also very important though for uh, researchers to be able to explore the research space. So certainly, you know, in the user studies we do, we we get people to do. Um, of course, they're all ethically reviewed, and we get people to uh, sign waivers to say they're happy for the data to be used in certain ways and stuff like that. And so that allows us the freedom to explore what some of the um, abilities the technology might be, and then also start having this conversation around what some of the ethical consequences are of the um, technology. I think it's going to be a huge challenge also with the metaverse and with large platform technologies like that, in that if you're trying to build an infrastructure like that, then no one company can control it. Otherwise, um, you could have some large um, ethical and societal problems that result uh, from that. So that's something that needs to be addressed as well, I think. I was going to ask him, like, so, you know, if we, if you take that, um, there's two ways of looking at creating connection then. And obviously there are implications of, of creating those connections based on the sensors that you use. There's one way which is using hardware, which is by I guess, using sensors, biometric data, all of this, this kind of stuff. But there's also software, right? In terms of there's things that you can do in an experience or in an application that can create connection as well. Um, I, I have a, a question then, which is based on, you know, what are, you know, in, in your mind, one of the smallest things that's easiest to achieve in the, in the next few years that I guess both that on one side, hardware manufacturers can add and or do to create connection or create better connection. And also on the, the other side, what software developers could do to you know add connection as well. Well, I think there's a couple of things. So if, if you're talking about the headset, um, the AMVR displays, then um, if you want to create a social connection then for sure being able to share people's um, eye gaze and face expression is super important and so you know you, you've seen now a number of um, in AI displays like the whole lens and the magic leap display they've got eye tracking included and also eye tracking is now in a number of VR uh, displays so that um, those being able to share eye gaze information like how where you're looking where you're blinking that's super important and then well, eye gaze also enables some gross measures of cognitive load. And so that's, that's really easy to do from a technical perspective. Um, heart rate is also technically easy to do now. Um, and then as Hewlett Packard showed with their face camera, it's very easy to add a camera on the front that allows you to um, measure people's lip motion. And so now create much more realistic uh, avatars. So, so the, the combination of, of eye gaze and of face um, mouth tracking um, and uh, will allow to create a very realistic avatar. And then adding the heart rate to that will enable to create very basic um, communication cues. So that's all from the hardware perspective. Then from a software perspective, there comes a lot of interesting uh, work around how to convey those, um, those states. And especially now, as you combine with machine learning, you, with a relatively a small amount of uh, input from these sensors, you can create a very rich um, emotional uh, characters and realistic uh, um, avatars that could be in uh, a VR or AR experience. And you can also infer a lot about people's emotional state from that as well. So I think we're going to see the combination of um, robust consumer sensors and then machine learning and AI will create uh, very rich emotional states. Now, on the software side, the software always evolves to some extent faster than hardware. So, um, you know, with the same sensor, you might be able to get an order of magnitude better um, uh, effect as you start combining better machine learning and AI techniques and um, better graphics and other pieces of software with it. Um, but there's also a really important element, again, back to the security and privacy, is that people have to be able to control what they are sharing with others. So in the software side, you have to be able to have control over um, the... Um, level of fidelity or what communication cues you're sharing with other people. For example, you may want to turn off your face expression sensor so people can't um, see uh, what um, face expressions you're showing while they're talking to you or telling jokes or whatever. Or you may want to turn off your eye tracking so that 
companies in VR don't know what you're looking at, so they can't uh, provide targeted advertising to you. So that's, I guess, my take is that there's a number of sensors that could be included now that will dramatically improve emotional and empathic connection combined with um, rich um, machine learning and AI models. And then there's a pathway to much uh, um, broader range of sensors such as EEG and EMG and other sensors that could be integrated into headsets in the next uh, five to 10 years time. This is fascinating and uh, um, it ties up really nicely with uh, um, one of the topics that I remember have been covered during a conference um, probably was like seven years ago that has been organized by uh, a very famous branding and marketing um, magazine here in the UK. And uh, uh, on that stage, at a certain point, we discussed the possibility for uh, brands of using machine learning algorithm to uh, embody into uh, the user's avatars the kind of brand message that they wanted to inject with their products. Like, for example, uh, let's say I'm a very clumsy person, as I am, because I'm a very clumsy person. And uh, uh, I am socially shy eventually, as I am sometimes. Uh, but I buy, uh, I don't know, uh, an Armani product that is exactly the opposite, that shows the man that is uh, very open or uh, very confident and uh, doesn't have any problem with uh, other people. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, comfortable in social situations and so on. Uh, and, and this kind of brands in the future may be able to apply filters exactly like right now we have uh, aesthetic filters and graphic filters on Instagram to the behavior of people's avatar based on the kind of brand message that they want to inject uh, according to the, 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 the products that they want to sell. And uh, uh, do you think that this is a possibility? Do you think that this is a, a foreseeable future for branding and marketing? Oh, for sure. So, um, and I could easily imagine uh, companies making, uh, I guess, behavioral modules that can not just branding companies, but other companies that could be used in much the same ways. Now you've got companies that sell uh, avatars and virtual goods into um, social VR and environments. You could have companies that could sell um, behavioral modules or emotion rec um, display modules that could be used as well. In fact, we, in our lab, we're doing a little bit of work in this space. One of my PhD students was looking at how, you know, um, you could map between a person's uh, real emotional state and their displayed emotional state. So you can you can imagine a, a person is sitting in front of um, a computer using the computer, and you've got the camera feed uh, from uh, of their face, and you're using that to drive a virtual avatar. So you've got uh, an avatar in a game or some VR environment that shows similar expressions to the uh, real person, but you could filter that. And so, for example, as you said, you might have some people that are uh, socially uh, shy, and so when they're feeling happy, they're they're you know if you did a one-to-one -one mapping onto their face, it may only show a small smile or it may not even show anything. But if we know the person's emotional state um, and we know that they're feeling happy, then we could exaggerate that and create avatars that are showing um, much more uh, outgoing, happy expressions. Um, and so you could imagine uh, that being done in a way. In fact, there's a, there's a, a, I went to an augmented reality conference last week and there was a, a, a project presented there that was used for uh, VTubers, so the, the video tubers that... Um, oftentimes will you know, use an iPhone or something to capture their face and they'll map it onto a, a character and then present a, 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 a live stream as them talking in this character. And they showed a very nice piece of work where they could um, artificially modulate the um, face expression of the real person onto the character. And so they make the character a lot more animated or um, a lot more expressive than the real person was being um, was being done, and 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 make the character a lot more extroverted than what was being done. So I think you'll have you'll see that happening uh, for sure, and that will um, uh, create a, a very interesting uh, kind of uh, social interaction where your 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 uh, virtual avatar is a lot more extroverted than than you are, and you might find that people have different personas 
in the virtual world than the real world. In fact, that's to some extent already happening with social networks where people on Facebook or, or Instagram may present a much more different persona than they are in the real life, you know, a lot more extroverted or or successful or whatever else. So there'll definitely be a market for that. And I could easily imagine branding companies like um, uh, like Adidas or Nike saying, well, you know, if you buy our um, Nike behavior module, we'll create um, a character that, that for some behavior suit is much more confident, or we have this rich range of face expressions that- As cool as Michael like, Jordan. <laughs> yeah, maybe like that. So, and then, then that also might create some interesting things where, you know, there's in psychology, there's um, William James said that uh, we uh, um, sometimes we um, uh, we feel happy because we act happy. And so if we've got these virtual characters that are displaying behaviors like being successful or confident or extroverted, then we might feel actually that those same behaviors start um, rubbing off uh, on us into the uh, real world as as well. That's great. That's uh, super interesting. And uh, I mean, uh, we don't have much time left. I, I would stay here like talking about you know, the <laughs> development of personalities based on the schizophrenic environment. We're going to grow in 20 years from now because we're going to have so many personas that, that we don't know what, which one we're going to develop more. Uh, but I mean, I think that's there's another thing that I really wanted to cover before we end up this episode, which is... Uh, the work that uh, uh, you and your uh, lab have been doing for Accenture for a wonderful project called Goodwill. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about what you've been doing and a little bit about the project? Sure. So this is a really fantastic project that Accenture has been doing, looking at how you can use uh, VR to train people that are returning back to um, society. So they may have been incarcerated or other situations and now they're trying to return into the uh, job market and it's, it's very difficult um, f sometimes to provide uh, skills like job interview skills when you haven't been involved in that for a number of years and so there are a number of training programs that that typically teach you how to do that you know, you have videos and books and teach you um, how to have good um, interview um, skills or job seeking skills but what Accenture is doing with this program is creating an immersive VR experience that provides those uh, same skills and so being able to uh, be immersed in a job virtual job interview and then be able to practice over and over again to um, get those skills you need to get a job in the real world and this is really exciting because this enables the person to practice in ways they couldn't do um, in the real world you know it's very expensive and time consuming to get a, an actor or, or an interviewer to come in and interview mul you multiple times to give you those job seeker skills. But in VR, you can do that over and over again. So that's a very uh, excellent project that, that Accenture has been doing over the year, uh, over the last year or two with um, Goodwill. And my role on the project is it's quite small, but the Accenture team is very talented, but they asked me to come along and help them with some of the uh, user evaluation um, side of things and to, to be able to evaluate the effectiveness of the um, project so in my lab we've done we've got a long history of doing user evaluation and so i'm always really happy to be able to come along and support uh the, the project and, and really, so how do you how i mean so how do you go about evaluating a, a you know a, a vr experience like that oh that's a very complicated question but, <laughs> but in, in, the, in the um in the easiest way to do it you, there's a number of ways you can do it but the simplest way is that um, before somebody um uh, undertakes the training you can have them do a practice interview with somebody and then the interviewer can uh, give some feedback, you know, and how confident they were or how well they came across. And then you can have them go through the cycle of training. And then after they've done the cycle of training, have them do a practice interview again. And hopefully the interviewer will have then seen a quantum um, jump in improvement in training. So that's just from an outside perspective, but you can also do other things as well. Uh, for example, you can have the person doing the training um, a complete a number of standardized surveys about how uh, confident they feel, um, how uh, how they feel like they came across an interview. And so you get them to fill out all these uh, questionnaires that um, they are asked to give some subjective feedback. And they can also give feedback on the technology, you know, how well they felt the technology helped them um, perform the, um, the training. 
in, in a more complicated case, and, and we're not doing that in this case, but um, in maybe the, the next version or the version after, we could use those headsets I was telling you about that record eye gaze and, and face expression and stress level to measure people's um, perf performance during the interview. For, for example, uh, if you've got that type of headset on, it may be quite important when you're having a job interview to um, maintain eye contact at different times, but not look too much at the other person's face. Otherwise, you come across as being staring all the time. So if we can monitor eye, eye gaze performance, then at the end of the interview, we might say, well, you know, the whole time you looked down at the table, it would be great if you could look up and make eye contact from time to time. Or, you know, instead of staring at their face for the whole time, maybe you should look around the room a little bit. So you can, um, once you capture the physiological cues, you can also provide a, um, a more objective measure of performance. But that's not what we're doing right now. That would be in maybe version two or three of the experience once you've got access to those more expensive um, headset displays. Yeah. So it's basically a, a combination of performance measures as well as people's um, subjective measures. Yeah, and it's a great. super exciting project. I'm, I'm really, I think it's going to really transform how um, Goodwill are able to provide these types of um, training experiences for uh, returning citizens. So, so just to, to, to I guess we're, we're we're sort of kind of coming to the end of this this podcast. But what we like to to do as well is just you know give you a, I guess a, a little bit of a platform one minute towards the end of this where you know if there's a key takeaway that you'd want listeners uh, or viewers to to take away from today's episode, I think you know now's your kind of like one minute to you know give that whatever whatever you want it to be and whatever the the key principle should be for you. Right. Well. Um... In my opinion, I think one of the most important things that uh, we can do in society is to create connection with other people and, you know, especially creating empathy and understanding. And I think that uh, AR, VR technology in combination with these uh, sense, physiological senses I've been talking about has a way to do that in a way that's never been possible before. So I'm really looking forward to over the next 10 years or so looking at how the technology can be used to create greater connection between uh, people greater empathy understanding and by using that uh, transforming um, society and if any of the things i've talked about are, are of interest to those who are listening please reach out and contact me it's very easy to find me and would be really excited to be able to collaborate with you on this and explore new ways that we can use the technology to create connection fantastic thank you so much mark for being with us this has been super interesting uh, we wanted to just remind to all of our viewers that uh, uh, you can find more episodes of Field of View on our YouTube channel. Just search for AIXR. You're going to find more episodes over there. But you can find us also on uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all the podcast platforms. Just search for Field of View. You're going to see all the episodes that are including Tom Furness uh, and all uh, the other people that you mentioned during this interview. Thank you so much, for Mark, for being with us. It's been a true pleasure and uh, uh, it's been super interesting. And I know that you still have to have your coffee and your breakfast. <laughs> and, uh, so we'll let you have your, your cup of coffee and uh, to your day. Thank you so much for being with us. And right. thanks, everybody, Thank for, so much, for being with us on this uh, new episode of Field of View. Thank you, right. Thank you very much. Well. Thank you. Through accessible insights, a solid network of support, and recognizing truly outstanding achievements near or far. Big or small, we're in this together. AIXR.